No, I enjoy good singing. And you've been singing well. I love singing. They say singing strengthens your heart and it does so many good things for you. Uh, you'll live to be an old person if you sing well. Well, I don't know if that's always true, but at least I'm trying to do it anyway. And we'll see how we get on. Thank you so much for coming tonight. I'm glad to see you. And uh, we welcome you all in Jesus' name. If this is your first time, then uh, it's just lovely to have you in the gathering. And I trust it will not be your last time. And that the Lord will make it a vital meeting for you. Uh, we're delighted. Glad to be going back to Port Rush tonight uh, after the service. Live there beside the sea. We can hear the waves uh, rolling in from where we live, just a little bit up from the metropole. And it's lovely to be able to walk out in the morning and just down around the corner in under the arch and right along to the harbor and back again for our daily constitutional. That's why we still look so fresh and sharp even though we are the age we are. Uh, our children are following us very much indeed. Uh, Wesley is not here tonight, but uh, he will be, I believe, with us Sunday night, and maybe a little more than that, coming down from the port, and who knows who else will come. Uh, Carol, some of you know us all by family, married to a pastor and sharing and laboring outside the city of Edinburgh in a new church plant there, and three Scottish grandchildren, Tabitha, Oscar, and Zara, and they're all following us with great interest uh, and the mission and praying. And then the youngest one that so many of you know about, our Emma, who on the 16th of July, 1990, was almost burned to death in a petrol fire and lay for six weeks in the burns unit in the Royal Victoria Hospital. Well, the Lord spared her life, and we thank God for bringing her through. And she's married, and she is a little girl, three years of age, and they live in the beautiful Spire City of Oxford, and that's where her work is. So they're all following us, and they're all interested in the mission, and we are excited to be sharing in this wonderful work. You know, when Jesus saved me, I never knew that he would make my life so interesting and give us such a wonderful life. And you know, when Yvonne's mother saw her marrying me, she thought that maybe Yvonne would be tied down for the rest of her life. She never knew that she was marrying a kite. And we've been traveling ever since and sharing the gospel, not only in this lovely country of ours and down to West Cork, but across into the mainland and across and over into India and Romania and America. And praise God for the exciting full life that we have. And so many people in these countries who are following us, in those that I've mentioned to you even now, and you know the greatest and most effective work of this mission might not be what happens in the services during these nights, but what is happening right out there across our land and right out across the world tonight. And yes, for the weeks and months and maybe even years ahead when people continue to follow us on social media and hear and see and feel and know the workings of God. So many of you also who are aware of our ministry on the internet, cfmireland.org, the ministry that reaches around the world again, Glad Tidings Hour on Facebook, also on YouTube. Every week we have a new program grows up and Yvonne, my wife, she shares in it hymn stories of great hymn writers. And of course now she's doing a whole great missions and missionary series. And the Lord has taken that and used it mightily and is going to continue to do so. Thank you for praying. We are very busy people, but not too busy to come and spend time at the lifeboat and be with you. And you know, a pulpit is, like I said many years ago, people are reminding me of things I said a long time ago, and I'm not sure whether they're making them up, <laughs> because I can't remember saying them, but you know, that's true. But I do remember saying this, a pulpit is like a lifeboat where lifelines are thrown to drowning men and women. And here I am tonight as part of the crew of the lifeboat Throwing lifelines to people who are sinking 
We have lifeguards at the beaches in Port Rush in the summertime. And invariably they are called to rescue someone who gets into difficulty off either of our beaches, the East Strand or the West Strand. I see myself also as a rescuer of people. And I come tonight to you, an old man now in my mid-70s, and thank God tonight for giving us the health and the sanity of mind, like the old guy said, thank God reason's still on the throne. <laughs> How long it will be, I'm not sure. But it's still there, and as long as reason is on the throne, Jesus shall have my reasoning, and I will trust and pray that he will continue to use us to bring people to the Lord Jesus Christ. I love Jesus. You know, folks, I wouldn't be doing this if I didn't love the Lord Jesus Christ. And I love him in life, and I love him in death, and praise him as long as he lends me breath. And sing when the death dew is cold on my brow, if ever I love thee, my Jesus, tis now. Would you not want to join me? Would you not want to be part of this great ministry? Would you not want to be part of the family of God and do something with your life? That will not only be an investment for time, but for eternity. And that when you stand before God and look back over life's finished story, you will see that you did something for Jesus who did so much for you. And look back with gratitude to the old rugged cross. Well, that's not the sermon. We better get on with it because we don't want to keep you too late tonight. Now we're reading tonight from the Gospel of Luke. And we're reading from Luke chapter 23. Luke chapter 23. Gospel according to St. Luke, the 23rd chapter, and commencing to read at the 33rd verse. Luke chapter 23 and verse 33. And when they were come to the place, which is called Calvary, there they crucified Jesus and the malefactors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. And the people stood beholding, and the rulers also with them derided him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself, if he be Christ, the chosen of God. And the soldiers also mocked him, coming to him and offering him vinegar, and saying, If thou be the king of the Jews, save thyself. And a superscription also was written over him in letters of Greek and Latin and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. And one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God? seeing thou art in the same condemnation. And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man hath done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily or truly, I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. We shall conclude there at verse 43. Thank you for following in the reading this evening. Let's just come to the Lord, please, together in a brief prayer. Now, our loving Lord Jesus, we are in thy house and we are in thy presence. And we thank you, Lord, this night for the promise of thy divine presence amongst us. And we are looking up to thee now as thy children tonight, those who know and love thee, Lord. And we are sending up to thee, Lord, earnest prayer and supplication 
that the Holy Spirit will do His work tonight in the hearts of those who still need to come to the cross. Lord, we pray this night that out of this passage of Scripture, Thy Spirit will take the Word and speak into all our hearts. Give, Lord, that wooing, that winnowing of the Spirit. O oh, my Father, tonight we pray in the precious name of Jesus that you will take off all the shielding and all the covering and all the cover-up that people have wrapped around themselves to prevent thy presence and thy word getting into their hearts. We pray this evening, Lord, that the warm rays of Calvary's love will sweep aside the hardness and bring, Lord, a tender brokenness into people's lives tonight in the awareness that Jesus, who never did amiss, gave himself as a sacrifice for us. And we pray, Lord, tonight that there will be salvation for some precious souls in the lifeboat mission. God, answer prayer. Now, Lord, help me, I pray. I am weak, dear Lord. I must decrease. But I pray, O oh Lord Jesus, be thou increased tonight and get to thyself the praise and the honor and the glory. We commit ourselves to thee just now. Amen and amen. If there was a title for my message for you this evening, it would be from the passage that we have read together, Last Words of a Dying Man. And one of those speeches or one of those phrases comes from the dying thief. And in the lovely hymn, there is a fountain filled with blood. There is a verse that says, The dying thief rejoiced to see that fountain in his day and there may I, though vile as he, wash all my sins away. I do believe, I now believe, that Jesus died for me, that on the cross he shed his blood from sin to set me free. But one of the statements of the dying thief that I'm thinking about particularly is this, Dost not thou fear God? Just those words. Dost not thou fear God? Five words. And then maybe just to open it out a little bit as we go on through the service in these final moments of the evening. We are all, I am sure, very well acquainted with the scene that was depicted right here and extended on through in the further verses of the passage where we come to earth's hub of history and that is the cross work of Jesus. Ladies and gentlemen, there is no work in human history that is so majestic, so significant, and so supernal as the work of the cross. Because all of Old Testament history and human history look forward with eager anticipation on the part of those who followed the Lord to that event. And all of those who have ever come to the cross look back tonight and say it was there at the cross, at the cross where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight and now I am happy all the day. We owe everything we have as the people of God to the finished work of the cross. Young Hudson Taylor, who became a renowned missionary to China, was reading one day when all the rest of the family had gone off, I think on a Sunday afternoon walk perhaps, and the young Hudson Taylor was reading and he came to this phrase, the finished work of the cross. The Holy Spirit took that phrase and settled it into Hudson Taylor's young heart and he came to the cross right then and there and experienced the saving grace of Jesus Christ. God so blessed young Hudson Taylor. Then a little later on, he gave himself as an offering and a sacrifice, consecrated to God to be a sanctified vessel filled with the Holy Ghost. And he went to China and blazed a trail for the Lord Jesus Christ across China, and his life became a legendary life. But it all hinged on that wonderful moment of revelation, the finished work of the cross. 
Maybe tonight there's somebody in the gathering and you're striving earnestly to attain favor with God. You are trying to build up brownie points with the Holy One of eternity. But the Bible says it is not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us. Oh, what about the mercy of God? The Hebrew word for mercy is a most wonderful, many-faceted word. It's the word hesed. And it is sometimes translated mercy, sometimes long-suffering, sometimes kindness, but grace. And so it's extended out, the hesed of God. And here this wonderful revelation of God's mercy is in the cross work of Jesus. And at the finished work of the cross, there is nothing more to be done. No works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy, He saved us. Yes, my dear people, it's written over and over again into our hearts. We are saved by faith through grace, and that not of ourselves, it is the gift of God. It is not of works. Did you get that? Not of works, lest any man should boast. My dear people tonight, not all the blood of Jewish, on Jewish altars, not all the blood of beasts on Jewish altars slain could give the guilty conscience peace or wash away the stain, but Christ, the heavenly Lamb, bears all my sins away a richer sacrifice and nobler blood than they. My faith would lay its hand on that dear head of thine while like, to, I, like a penitent I stand and there confess my sin. Oh, happy day when Jesus washed my sins away. This Friday night, there is a man, there is a woman, and you need to come to that cross. You need to bow at the foot of the old rugged cross. You need to put away your self-righteousness. You need to be done with working to attain salvation because the saving grace of Jesus is a packaged gift. And friends, tonight it's the full package and it's the perfect package and it's given to you freely by a merciful God to be embraced to be appropriated, and to be believed on. Will you trust Him? Would you do it now even before we go one sentence farther? Would you not come this moment to the cross and there yield yourself to Him? Some years ago we had the wonderful privilege of having Dr. John Moore stay in our home. He came over from Scotland. He had been preaching in a convention at our broth. And he came across to be one of our attendees at the great drive-in church services that we used to have in the East Strand car park. And he played so beautifully at the piano as he sat down to sing and began to play across the keyboard and then began to sing some beautiful hymns. But there is a magnificent hymn that was written by John Moore. And it's this, Days are filled with sorrow and care. Hearts are lonely and drear. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Jesus is very near. Troubled soul, the Savior can see every heartache and tear. Jesus is very near. When, when many years back in 1962 or 1963, in the Belgian Congo during the Simba uprising, the McAllisters' lives were spared. Bob's forehead was grazed with a pass, passing bullet. His close friend, Hector McMillan, died on the spot. The rest were rescued and escaped in a merciful, miraculous escape. But there was another lovely missionary family, the Perrys with their little ones, and they were walking out with the bayonets and the guns and the Simbas behind them, marching them out to a little grassy slope. And as they were traveling out there, one of the little girls, about, I think, 10 years of age, if I remember the story correctly, 
as they were being taken out to be shot and martyred for Jesus Christ, she began to sing, Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Jesus is very near. John said, The day I wrote that song, I never thought that it would go round the world. I never thought that it would be translated into so many languages. But friends, tonight the message is still true. Oh, this wonderful Jesus, this precious cross work that's so despised by so many and so loved by so many. I wonder how it falls with you tonight. I wonder tonight, do you love the old rugged cross work of Jesus? Or is it nothing to you tonight as you pass by it? It was like that on this day in the Bible reading. The soldiers mocked him. There were those who said, he saved others. Let him save himself and come down if he is the Christ. The dying thief on this side said, if thou be the Christ, save thyself and us, as he blasphemed the man on the middle cross. You know, that reminded me of something. Right at the beginning of our Savior's ministry, the devil came and said, If thou be the Christ. And of course, here comes the satanic authority and power again through this individual as he is possessed by the dark spirit of that nether region. And he says, If thou be the Christ. Satan's always saying, If thou be the Christ. We take our stand with the Apostle Peter and say, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, Yes, and that's true. And on this statement, on this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Amen, friends. I'm getting a bit of liberty in my spirit now, and authority in the name of Jesus. And the cross work is the tremendous victory of the eternal Son of God against all the hordes of hell and darkness, all the prince demons, principality demons, power demons, wicked spirits, spiritual darkness, against them all tonight because the Bible describes the cross of Calvary as the most raging battle that was ever fought. And the Lord said, the strong bulls of Bashan. And what is he referring to? The demon powers that swept up to the cross of Calvary. And it says he spoiled principalities and powers. And he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in the cross. And thank God tonight, he is the victor. He is the champion. Jesus really reigns. And he's really ascended. And friends, he's really coming again. He surely is. But if we were to change our thinking tonight to the man on the other side, who is also a dying man. And you know, deathbeds can concentrate people's thinking. And these men were all on death row and on a deathbed now. Two of them had been robbers. And it means the word in the Greek to, to rob with, uh, with, with uh, viciousness and with anger and to do harm. And maybe they were like Barabbas. They were murderers. And here they are now paying for the crime that they had done. But the man in the middle cross had no crimes for which to die. But he took the crimes of my life and your life, our sins, all the sins of humanity upon his blessed heart and bore them all to the tree. Amen. I'm so glad this evening for that. And during those hours of agony and anguish, here are two individuals. And what about the providences that are in their lives? Yes, my dear people, there were providences even on crosses. And you say, well, Eric, how do you make that out? Well, here in this very respect, they both had the providence of being within speaking distance of Jesus Christ. And that, my dear friends, is a tremendous providence to be within speaking distance of the Lord Jesus Christ, to be close enough to call and be heard by him. There's not a man, there's not a woman in this building tonight nor on any place or pla of our planet who will ever watch these services 
Should they watch them in this land or in other lands? And Sharon tonight was showing me some of the count-ups on all the different Facebook services. And friends, there's going to be thousands of people who will watch these services. And wherever they are, and wherever you may be tonight, and whatever time you may watch this, remember tonight that we are focusing on a cross work where two men are within speaking distance of Jesus Christ. You can call upon him, and he will hear you. He tells us that. And he says, call upon me in the day of trouble, and I will answer thee. Was a man ever in more trouble than this man? Never. Was he in more trouble when he was apprehended? Not, not in the days previous. Was he in trouble now? He was at the very apex of trouble. He was in the last hours of his life. And whatever troubles we are ever in, it is possible to call upon the Lord Jesus. You are provident tonight in that you are here with a thinking mind. You are here with an intelligent mind. You are here with the reasoning ability. And you are in the very presence of the Savior of whom I speak. And you can ask him. You can speak to him. You can call upon him. And you can invite him into your heart. If you have drifted from him as a backslider, then tonight you can come right back to him. Back to the cross under the blood. What a glorious providence it is to be within speaking distance of our Savior. Not only that, but they had equal access to the Christ. Both of them, whatever way they were hanging, were able to at least turn their head, and they could have seen the superscription above, that middle cross victim, the King of the Jews. And maybe that's why they thought of calling out and saying, if thou art the Christ, save thyself. Kings can speak words of salvation or pardon, a royal pardon perhaps. They both had the privilege of being not only close to the Savior, but of seeing who he really was. And it's in meetings like these that we become aware of someone that is more than just a historic figure someone who lived and walked around Galilee and down to Jerusalem and through Jericho and so on and so forth, and we come beyond seeing him as even a good man or a special man or somebody who is a miracle worker. We come to the point where we see him as our only Redeemer, the only Christ of God, the only begotten Son, and we feel ourselves to not be just working in our minds in front of some pastor or evangelist or speaker, but we look beyond that and we feel there are only two people who are prominent now in this world as far as I'm concerned, and that is me, myself, and Jesus, my Redeemer. That's what it narrows down to. And when people are sitting in services like these, you know, invariably over the years we have heard them say, it seemed as if I was the only one in the service. It seemed as if God was speaking just to me. It seemed as if the speaker was just displaying and portraying my life. I know what I'm speaking about. I was there. I have been there. No one else really mattered on that 3rd of March, 1962. It was me and Jesus. And the question was, what would I do with Jesus? And not only that, but again, the providence of God is that both could witness the gracious way in which the man on the middle cross was dying. I can imagine, dear friends, that as these men were brought to Calvary's hill and were placed on those horizontal crosses that they would not have submitted gladly, that they would not have submitted easily, 
but were pinned down by strong Roman soldiers as they drove the spikes into their hands and feet and then lifted them up. And maybe with oaths and curses, they cursed their lot that they were ever born or that they were ever caught up in the web of sinful folly that they were in. And now here they were, nailed to trees. But there was no such writhing. There was no such rebellion. There was no such resistance. There were no such oaths ever slipped the lips of our blessed Savior. He said, I lay down my life. Amen, friends? I lay down my life. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, said Isaiah. It's very interesting when Isaiah said that in Isaiah 53. He is led as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. He was led from prison and from judgment, from judge. And who shall declare his generation? For he is cut off from the land of the living. He is the suffering servant. His sufferings physically were no less than the sufferings of the men on either side. Three crosses spelt out the same agony of suffering for three men on that day. But for this man in the middle cross, there is a dimension of suffering that no man ever plumbed nor no angel ever knew when he took upon himself my sin and your sin and the sin of the whole world. And the eternal father turned aside and turned his back on his son and darkness came down and the rocks rent around and a cry pierced the grief-laden air. Oh, the anguish of those dark hours on Golgotha's hill. The hymn writer said, O Calvary, dark Calvary, where Jesus bled and died. But he didn't stop there. He went on to say, O Calvary, blessed Calvary, t'was there my Savior died for me. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, what a sacrifice. As God turned away, and the forsaken one is there. And out from the grief-laden air, there goes the cry, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why? The biggest why in human exclamation And the most majestic answer to pay the price that I might go free. To suffer the shame that I might be clothed. To drink the cup of agony that I might never drink the flames and agonies of eternal hell. Oh, my dear people, what a Savior. They watched him. They saw him die. And what an impressive death it was. None of the ransomed ever knew how deep were the waters crossed, nor how dark was the night that the Lord passed through ere he found the sheep that was lost. Out in the mountains he heard its cry. Whose cry? Your cry. My cry. Sick and helpless and ready to die. 
as the lonely, agonizing hours crept by, one man began to realize, I may be far gone. My life is fleeting fast. My life's blood is dripping from hands and feet and scourged body. But I am not too far gone to call out to this Savior on the middle cross. He looked across at his friend on the other side, and probably their friendship was no longer a friendship. He looked across and he saw him blaspheming, speaking rough. And he said to him, Do you not fear God? That you could speak like this? There are still many people who speak roughly about Jesus. There are still many people who scoff the cross. And they may not speak to Jesus as if they were speaking directly to him, although there are people like that, but they lash out against those who love Jesus. And they would almost spit on them. There was one man just like that on that day. But this man said, Do you not fear God? We are receiving what we deserve. You're in the same condemnation as me. What had he realized? He realized he was a condemned man, justly condemned. And that's a good step towards salvation when we feel, I am a condemned man. I am a condemned woman. I am under condemnation because of what I have done. And here I am. I did the crime. And I'm doing the time. And the time was running out. Dost not thou fear God? seeing that thou art a condemned individual. My dear people, to be under the condemnation of God ought to make us fear God. Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art a dying man? My dear people, the awareness that there is but a heartbeat between me and eternity ought to put within me a godly fear that I could step out and drop into eternal hell without Jesus. Would that not put shivers up your spine and put the fear of God in you if you could look around and see the flames of hell over the archways of that door into that awful abyss? You would flee, as Jesus said, from the wrath to come. Dost not thou fear God? Seeing but there is a step between you and death, seeing that days and moments are quickly flying, blending the living with the dead, soon will you and I be lying each within our narrow bed. How will it be with you then? Dost not thou fear God on the verge of eternity? Griffith Jones was a great Welsh preacher in the revival. And he was preaching one night. And he spoke what we wouldn't do now, but maybe in the culture of those days he spoke. There was a man quite disturbed in the congregation. And he spoke to him. And spoke and asked him to come to the Lord. Jesus Christ, he knew that God was dealing mightily with him. And the man spoke back to the speaker. And he said, to hell with you and your Christ. And there went a deathly silence over the congregation. And Griffith Jones looked down and he said, young man, the plank for your coffin is in the undertaker's shop. The next morning, the preacher was sitting at breakfast. 
and some men walked past carrying a body. It was the body of the young man who had spoken so brashly in the meeting the night before. He was a coal miner boy, and he left and he went to the mines. And that night there was a fatal accident in the mine, and he was the one who was fatally injured. The prophetic word of the preacher was true. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Dost not thou fear God on the verge of eternity? Now, the time is almost gone, and I don't want to be longer much, but I've said this. That's not the last words of the man. That's not the dying man's final words. Unable to move any of the rest of his body. Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. Surely this man whose name is the king of the Jews has a kingdom. And I want to be in it. This man who is the king of the Jews is the savior of sinners. And I want to be one of those saved men. They are saved sinners. Remember me, Lord. And in that small phrase, remember me, there goes all the feeling of guiltiness, of repentance, and of trust. Because the Savior said, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Friends, tonight, it doesn't need to be a long prayer to get right with God. My, I tell you, one piercing cry. Just a sentence. Just a phrase. God, remember me. And obviously the Lord Jesus had read his heart and knew what he meant by that appeal. Ladies and gentlemen, the Lord Jesus will read your heart. And it doesn't matter how it stumbles out in the moment of confession. He will take your heart register. And if your heart is in it, and your soul is in it, you will be reconciled to God in a moment of time. There seemed to be no further conversation between the two men. Nothing that is recorded. But there was enough recorded by our dear friend Luke to let us know that this man looked and lived, though he died. For whosoever liveth and believeth in me, said Jesus, shall never die. It's a very real encouragement to me, dear friends. I know that sometimes I'm very serious whenever I'm preaching, and I'm really in the zone, but it's a very real encouragement when I look down and I see people assenting, nodding their heads, amening in their hearts. And I know that so many of you are with me this evening. DeWitt Talmadge was a powerful preacher in America. I have three books of sermons that he preached. 
But you know, in one of those, he said this, and I may have wrote it down, and I want you to get what he said. The saddest thing in all the earth is a deathbed with a wasted life standing on one side and an overwhelming eternity on the other side and no Jesus anywhere in the room. The saddest thing in all the earth is a deathbed with a wasted life standing on one side of it and an overshadowing eternity standing on the other side and no Jesus standing anywhere in the room. That will be your condition if you sin away your day of grace and you grieve the Holy Spirit and missed your final opportunity, when you come to die, there will be a wasted life behind you, an overshadowing eternity ahead of you, and no Jesus anywhere in the room. And that, to me, is a definitely dark picture. And the saddest picture on the face of God's earth. He also said, There are two things that I do not want to have bother me in my final hours, and that is my earthly affairs and the safety of my soul. You may say, Eric, I've taken care of my earthly affairs. They will not bother me in my final hours. But I'm asking you, have you attended to the business of your immortal soul salvation? Because if you haven't done till now, then this can be your night. Dost not thou fear God? Seeing thou art condemned, seeing thou art but a heartbeat from eternity. O oh God, remember me. Have mercy on me. Come to the cross. I submit, I yield, I yield. I can hold out no longer. I sink by Calvary's love compelled and crown thee conqueror. Aren't you glad so many of you that that moment came for you? My goodness, tonight I, I'm looking down and I see a number of men sitting here this evening and my heart just thrills because over 50 years ago they came to the Lord Jesus Christ in evangelistic missions in County Armagh. And here they are now. And here I am. 52 years, 50 years, further down life's road. And praise God. The dying thief rejoiced to see that fountain in his day. And there did they, as vile as he. Amen. Wash all their sins away. Jesus hasn't changed. The door is still open. The invitation is still the same. The opportunities are guilt-edged yet. Why not trust him?
Let's pray. Oh, Lord Jesus, tonight we thank you that one man got in. Oh, yes, Lord, only one deathbed repentance, but one nevertheless. One man got in. The other slammed the door of opportunity back in the face of the Savior and dying and sank into eternal darkness. The other swept home to glory with the Savior. And 2,000 years farther on, their eternities have not changed. My God, my Father. It's enough to swamp an, angel, an archangel, the concept of such an eternity. I pray that some man or woman tonight will break through and trust the Lord Jesus Christ. as we're bowed together in prayer, and what a meeting it has been. I feel it. So do you. Which thief are you going to be? The rejecter? Or the accepting one? Say, O oh God, reject no longer. O oh God, I reject Jesus no longer. Calvary's sacrifice no longer. Tonight, I will be His. Tonight, I will come back to the Lord. God knows where I am. I've lost out. I'm backslidden. I need to come back to the cross. And I come now. I'm doing it now so that the rest of my life will be employed to the pleasure of my Savior. If God has spoken to your heart, I'm going to ask you to indicate that response tonight to come to the Savior and to seek Him just now. As we're bowed together, if you're coming to the cross of Jesus tonight, would you lift up your hand as an indication that you're coming to the Lord Jesus Christ and you're saying, yes, Eric, I am going to trust the Savior tonight. I am going to come back to the Lord tonight. I can't read your heart. I can't read your thoughts. But somehow I think there should be a man or a woman in our building tonight who should trust Jesus like the dying thief did. Would you lift up your hand if you're here and you're saying, yes, Eric, tonight I'm coming to the cross. Young person or older, people are praying for you. They don't know you, but Jesus knows you. And you're saying, Lord, this is the night. I'm coming now. Slip it right up in the quietness and in the atmosphere of the service. Will you do that? Come just as you are. Don't turn him away. Don't reject him. Is there anyone? Could there be one tonight? Has it to be that no one will trust Jesus? the finished work of the cross. Come. Come now. I'm watching. Anybody? Oh, Lord. I come to tonight. Now. Dear Lord Jesus, we cannot but help feel that this is not the end of this meeting, that this meeting will continue to record and register victories for our blessed victorious Christ right on through the months and years ahead. 
and that when we meet in heaven, there will be people there who through this evening's ministry will yield to the man who gave his life on the middle cross. God bless the people tonight, Lord. Bless thy people tonight. Be with them, we pray. And each family circle that's represented in this building. And Lord, for the mercy and grace of God, we pray for our unconverted loved ones. Don't let them die in their sin, Lord. Bring them to the cross. Help us, Lord, to help them there. Oh, hear and answer the prayers of praying parents, we pray, and bring their children in. And loved ones near and far, now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God, our dear Father in heaven, and the communion of the blessed Holy Spirit Abide with us as your people until we meet again. In Jesus' name, amen.